first day to field in Port St. Lucie, Florida. The New York Mets play the Houston Astros. Spring training on SNY is presented by City. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit Geico.com to see how much you could save. By City, proud partner of the New York Mets. By Cadillac, visit TristateCadillac.com for exceptional offers. And by Empire City Casino, Manhattan's closest casino. Game on. That's well, another gorgeous day in South Florida. Temperature will be in the mid 80s for this afternoon's game. Plenty of chance for Met fans to get a glimpse of their heroes. Watch their pitchers take a little batting practice and watch the captain as well get himself ready, hopefully for opening day. And a pleasant good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Port St. Lucie. I'm Gary Cohen. Ron Darling joins me in just a few moments. The Mets will take on the Astros today. The Mets have a few closer in rivals now in Florida. A new ballpark complex has gone up in West Palm Beach. The Astros are going to be sharing it with the Washington Nationals. They'll open that ballpark tomorrow. But the Astros are here for the first of seven meetings with the Mets this spring. And they brought along some of their best talent. Jose Altuve, the defending American League batting champion, is here. Alex Bregman, their terrific young prospect at third base, is here. So is the U.S product George Springer who will play center field so the Mets and Astros get together this afternoon an interesting story on the mound for the Mets today P.J. Conlon the left hander will make the start trying to become the first native born Irishman to make it to the big leagues since 1945 it'll also be our first look today at Mets closer Jay Reese Familia he will make his first outing of the spring when we come back Steve Gelbs is standing by with one of the Mets young Prospects Gavin Cicchini. That's coming up next when we return to Port St. Lucie. There's a place in America where you can all. Save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit Geico.com to see how much you could save. By W.B. Mason, the official office supply company of the New York Mets. Who bought W.B. Mason? And by Ford, for great deals on Ford cars, trucks, SUVs, and crossovers, visit buyfordnow.com. 
Mets and Astros getting set here in Port St. Lucie and down by the Mets dugout. Steve Gelbs is standing by with Gavin Cicchini. Steve. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, Gavin, for you, different offseason coming off a year in which you, you finally made it. You made it to the big show. What do you take out of last year into this offseason that you really wanted to work on? Yeah, I think it's just about uh, being consistent with uh, my overall game and, and keep working hard to uh, do everything I can to uh, put my team in the best position to win. And, um, you know, being consistent is the name of this game and the more you can do that the better off you'll be was there anything that surprised you once you got up here no I mean it's the same game um, the only difference that that, that um, you know makes it you know the, the great ones from the just the average ones is like I said just being consistent with your overall games and repeating your swings repeating you know your throws and, and mechanics and uh, you know filling the ground balls cleaning making the routine plays and like I keep saying it's all about consistency when you're a young player and you you come up to the big leagues is there one person in particular that you looked at and said I want to try and emulate him I want to see how he goes about his business and maybe even something like that that you're doing right now in spring yeah. training yeah definitely I think um, one person that stands out for me is David Wright obviously his numbers speak for himself he's the captain of our team and the way he carries himself on and off the field you know that's what you know I want to do and, and handle myself because you know he's a first-class guy I know when you look to try and make yourself that consistent player defensively you've had some errors in the past that's one aspect I know you've said you wanted to work on what specifically defensively are you looking to improve in spring and then when you get into the season yeah I think it's really just slowing slowing myself down out there uh, sometimes you know uh, maybe I can get in a rush which throws off my timing and you know my footwork so the more I can slow things down out there and stay within myself the better off I'll be Gavin appreciate it and good luck I know in a week you're coming up on the World Baseball Classic with Team Italy yeah it's going to be a, a great opportunity to go out there and play against the best competition so I'm, I'm very excited appreciate it Gavin. Yep, back you. up to you all right, Steve. Uh, thank you to Gavin. That interview presented by City. The Astros are in town for the first meeting with the Mets this spring. Terry Collins getting his gang ready. First pitch coming up from Port St. Lucie. is uh, otherwise occupied today. <laughs> Wave high. 
Good Doing luck. great, Billy Ray. Don't wave to him. He'll just blow you off. <laughs> Here's your Toyota starting lineup for the Astros today. A lot of uh, regulars here for the Astros. Springer and Bregman and Altuve and uh, Guriel and McCann, all starting players, all making their first appearance of the spring and making the trip up from West Palm Beach. The Astros moved from Kissimmee into that new complex in West Palm, which opens for its first real game tomorrow. they got to be so happy, right, to move from Kissimmee to West Palm. P.J. Conlon on the mound for the Mets, the Sterling organizational Pitcher of the year last year. And what a season he had. His first pitch is low and away for ball one to George Springer. Conlin, 23 years old, born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. His family moved to California when he was two. But if he makes it to the major leagues, he's got some serious history to break. Last player from Belfast to make it to the big leagues, Harry McElveen. <laughs> Who pitched for the New York Highlanders before they became the Yankees, 1906 to 1909? And there's Conlon's first strike. Interesting watching Conlon pitch. He's a guy that has all four pitches, best changeup in the system for the Mets. First two pitches of this game, changeups. Yep. You don't see that very often. Little looper off the bat of Springer, and Flores over into foul ground to get it for the first out of the day. Defensively from the Mets, Cespedes, Granderson, and Bruce. That's going to be your outfield maybe when the season starts. Philip Evans, Cabrera, Rivera, and Flores across the infield. And Rene Rivera and Darnell look like they're on that every other day plan. Now Alex Bregman, one of the uh, rising stars in this game. And he hits one in the air to center, chasing Granderson back, well back to the warning track beyond his reach, and out of here. Or did it hit on the warning track? I think it did. Warning track did. It did on, hit on the warning track, so it's a ground rule double for Bregman. You know, it's interesting, Gary. You were talking the other day that Curtis has moved in where he feels more comfortable, but the wind really is rushing out, not rushing out, but pushing out to left center and left field, so anything over the heads of the outfielders in center and left is going to be over their head. Well, yesterday was a very different kind of day with the wind gusting in from right field. This is more of a typical day here in Florida with that wind blowing out and that ball kept working away from Granderson. Wind blowing right across toward left. Here's Jose Altuve. Won his second batting title last year with a transcendent season. Hit 338 with 24. I was uh, saying to you before the game started, Gary, all of a sudden he's become Joe Morgan mm. Altuve. A right handed version. Not the same size. Joe might have had an inch or two on him. And pick off try at second, and Bregman gets back in. Altuve, 200 plus hits for the third straight year, and easily won the American League batting title. At age 26, a four time All Star, three time Silver Slugger. And a great advertisement for the fact that uh, size is no object in this game. <laughs> well, that's one of the uh, great things about baseball, isn't it? That you can be any size and be successful. Complete player, despite the smaller package. And a curveball in for a strike two and one. What's interesting to me is that with the emergence of Altuve, the uh, Astros have another player in camp now, a young player named Tony Kemp, who may actually be Altuve's backup at second base, was also five foot six. I guess once you've had success in that role once, it makes you more encouraged that another player can pull it off as well. I'd like to find out if it's the same scout who scouted both players. Remember when I was very young, the Angels had an outfielder named Albie Pearson, mm. who was five foot three. And then a little bit later, the Kansas City Royals had an outstanding shortstop named Freddie Patek, who stood five foot four, but still an anomaly. And then Colin rushes one inside, and it's full count. Shake of the head by Altuve Sign signifies that that ball was in. Colin will also cut the ball in on right handed hitters. the MVP race in the American League last year. 
Altuve finished third, probably right about where he should have been behind Mike Trout and Mookie Betts. Astros finished third in the American League West last year. Took a small step back after winning 86 games and getting in the wild card two years ago. That's inside, and Altuve is on with a walk, and the Astros have two men on. Well, you've heard his voice, but here's what Ron Darling looks like. Well, I was talking about Conlon and what he has as his repertoire. I didn't even know he threw right-handed or left-handed when I got to the park today, but did some work, and now I know. This is how you prepare for your job. That's right. It's interesting with the Mets' great pitchers not pitching until first week in March. You're going to see a lot of these younger players, that you, pitchers that you wouldn't necessarily see. I think that's a good thing. Well, we saw yesterday uh, Paul Seawall pitched very well in his start. David Roseboom pitched two good innings. Guys who might not otherwise have had a chance in a normal spring to get as many innings early in games. Josh Reddick signed a four year deal with the Astros after playing for Oakland and the Dodgers last year. He'll be the starting right fielder most days. And what that serves to do is move George Springer, who played right field last year, over to center. Well, Springer is just a, a tremendous athlete. He's a big athlete, too, to be able to play center field. Reddick is a guy who, over the course of his career, has at times provided great power, but it's been inconsistent power, which made it a little bit of a head scratcher that he got as big a contract as he did. Fly ball out to center. And Anderson is there to grab a two out. Four years, four years, fifty-two million dollars for a guy who had ten home runs and almost four hundred at bats last year. Well, I think that the guys who ended up signing early were the ones that got the big contracts. This, you know, Cespedes, of course, with the Mets, uh, Reddick. But you know, all the sabermetrics and all the things to analyze players. Josh Reddick, at minute made field, one ninety-four hitter. Well, we'll see. Yeah. A.J. Hinch is hoping uh, for more than that. Well, here is probably the most intriguing player the Astros have, Yulieski Guriel, the Cuban defector who came over last year and got a taste of the big leagues, looked a little bit rusty when he when he got there, but a guy who just was an enormous star in Cuba, 335 lifetime hitter in 15 seasons in the Cuban National Series. And he pops one up. Cabrera retreats to call. And that retires the side. A double and two left. Mets come to bat on the bottom of the first in Port St. Lucie with no score. Backfield, where more and more of the minor leaguers are checking in. Here's your Geico Mets starting lineup. 
Cabrera Granderson Cespedes right Bruce a lot of big names in the Mets lineup today. It's a go slow kind of a spring this first week with the extended spring training the result of the World Baseball Classic. It is uh, the Mets fourth game and it's it's still February. That's right. Uh, as Joe Musgrove who had some time with the big club last year in Houston no, former number one pick of the Toronto Blue Jays came over in a trade in 2012. As Dribble Cabrera will lead things off. You know one of the uh, open questions for Terry Collins and I, I don't think he has any idea what the answer is. Is on the days that Jose Reyes does not play. Who's the leadoff yeah. hitter for this team. Yeah, as it, as it Grandy, I mean, you can tell him. You can see today trying to experiment a little with Cabrera leading off and Granderson in the two hole. Well, Curtis, you know, who doesn't often express himself publicly about these things, has made it clear he would like to be the number two hitter. He says that's where he's most comfortable. That's toward the corner near the pole, and it's a home run. Cabrera just kept it fair inside that shortened left field foul pole and he has his first home run of the spring and it's one nothing New York. Well it's a good day to hit today that was really just a pop up from Cabrera that just carried right out of this ballpark. And the question whether the wind would blow it foul which it almost did. But the third base umpire Nick Marley judged it fair and the Mets take an early lead. You know one of the things I'm noticing and it's probably from their off season conditioning Cabrera and everyone they look bigger stronger than they were last season. I mean if you are a pitcher when this happens you're just shaking your head on the mound like really is this is how we're going to start the day. Well and for a guy like Musgrove who had a bit of a home run problem in his brief big league tenure last year that's the last way you want your spring training to start first time out to the mound. One and two to Granderson a hard thrower throws uh, you know can throw up to 95 miles an hour good slider you can sink the fastball also tall lean kid 24 years old grew up in El Cajon California. Late swing foul by Granderson. Musgrove had a spectacular big league debut last year. He came up in August, and um, Lance McCullers, the extremely talented but off injured starter for the Astros, left a game in the fifth inning. Musgrove came in in long relief, had not been warming up because it was an injury. So you have to warm up in front of 25,000 people and you know how difficult that is in a normal circumstance but when it's your big league debut it's got to be even more nerve wracking. Well what did he do. He retired the first 10 batters struck at eight over four and a third. They should never tell him when he's pitching <laughs> for the rest of his career. That was his only relief <laughs> outing. He then made 10 starts and had some you know up and down times middling success but he is a candidate for a spot in the back of the Astros rotation this spring How about that weight six five two sixty eight short hop by Guriel and he makes the play one out yeah you know a lot of um, a lot of Major League Baseball players played football in high school and almost to a man they're quarterbacks and defensive backs and running backs not Joe Musgrove he was an offensive and defensive lineman wow oh man I don't see too many of those guys get into the big leagues. Uh, root hogs is what we used to call them, Gary. <laughs> when you're a lineman in football, it is the worst existence. Your practice is just so different from the quarterbacks in the red jerseys. Suspicious takes ball one. Yeah, it's it's easy to understand if you have professional level talent and you think you might make a yes. lot of money in the game. It's less understandable why you'd want to do that just for fun. Pushing that sled around. Oh. Zespedes making his second start of the spring had a long double to center field in the game on Saturday. Must grow behind him 2 and 0 oh and Cespedes fouls it off.
the stories about Cespedes and the weight that he's been lifting with his legs are legendary already. Well, after last year suffering with that quad injury for such a large portion of the season, that's over the bag. Nice play by Bregman, and the long throw on a couple of hops doesn't get there in time. Not a strong throw by Bregman, and Cespedes has an infield hit. Well, Bregman tried to gather himself and get off that back foot and get something on the throw, but he takes too long. That's just a case of not knowing that Cespedes can run. So the second hit of the inning. And now David Wright DHing again today. David is still not in full throw mode by any means. Still trying to work up the shoulder strength coming back from the next surgery that sidelined him most of last year. Well, if the applause he's getting for the Mets fans would help his health, <laughs> he's gotten some great applause so far. Doesn't hurt. No. Positive vibes are a great tonic. Now, David just wants to be able to be on the field as much as possible this year after playing just 75 games the last two years. And he's got his first hit of the spring. Hit a couple of balls hard in his first outing on Saturday. And now he's aboard. Yeah, he had a, a good hit to center field, almost caught it on the nose, lined out the third base, and he had quick enough to get that ball inside from Musgrove, get it in the hole. So now Jay Bruce will bat with two on. Cespedes at second, right at first with one out. Rough beginning for Musgrove, who was greeted with a leadoff home run by Cabrera, and now Bruce hits a double play ball. An easy step and throw to retire the side. But as Dribble Cabrera gets the Mets off to a fast start, tucks one just inside the left field foul pole. Cabrera's first of the spring, and the Mets have a one nothing lead after one in Port St. Lucie. Brian McCann leads off the second for the Astros. Former Yankee, former Brave, now in an Astros uniform. Mm. 
Can now 33 years old and he takes inside it goes off his hand so he is hit by a pitch. So P.J. Conlon plunks Brian McCann to start the second inning. Oh two pitch looks like he caught him in the forearm just shook it off. It's uh, nerves for a guy like Conlon who's got impeccable control. Okay, here's one of my pet peeves in baseball. Okay. Brian McCann is at first base. Why are you holding him on? <laughs> Agree. Okay, right? Yes. I mean, even in a regular season game, he's not going anywhere, but particularly in a spring training game, Brian McCann's not running. Alex White oh. takes a curveball for a strike. Or Tyler White, excuse me, the DH for the Astros. Had the greatest first week in Houston Astros history last season. Which was really his only That's, good week. Yeah. I mean, it just tells you the fortunes of baseball. He hits, goes 10 for 18 in his first week, player of the week, and by June he was sent down to AAA. 249 at bats. He wound up hitting 217. But his uh, his story is already a successful one, even if he does nothing else. Double play ball right at Evans. T.J. Rivera with the turn for the easy 5-4-3 double play. Tyler White was a walk-on at Western Carolina University. Think about that. He was a walk-on at Western Carolina University. And so his his story is almost as unlikely as the guy in the middle with his double play <laughs> T.J. Rivera. But both have now played in the big leagues. This article I believe in the post today about T.J. Rivera. Ken David off road again. Yeah. He is uh, he is certainly a beacon T.J. is and you can put Tyler White in that same category for guys who have been counted out. Yeah. Undrafted free agent kid from the Bronx who persevered showed he could hit at every level and finally got his chance last season. Jake Marisnik at the plate. Former Marlin former Blue Jay. Still only 25 years old. And he might be a piece for the Astros in that they now have Nori Aoki to be their left fielder but Aoki struggles against lefties and if Marisnik can hit at all. He's a terrific fielder and they might platoon him. You know, when Marisnik was first drafted you could sense that he could have had a chance to be a star in this league but he hasn't been able to hit enough. Well the Marlins had Marisnik and Christian Yelich coming up about the same time and there was actually conversation about which one they should keep. Nice stop by Evans. He pops to his feet and throws out Marisnik. Philip Evans showing off the leather. That's a terrific play by the Eastern League batting champion. And he guns down Marisnik after saving a double. Evans on the money to Flores, side retired.
Wilmer Flores first pitch swinging flies one out to left field and Jake Marisna camped under it one pitch and one out in the bottom of the second. De defensively for the Astros you saw Marisna catch that ball Springer in center Reddick and right Bregman Brignac Altuve and Gurriel at first and the veteran Brian McCann behind the plate. Altuve can pick it too at second base not only is he a great offensive player. Now T.J. Rivera. T.J. playing second base today. Well, this is the Early. best time Early. for a guy like T.J. Rivera to play in the major leagues because every team is looking for that versatile performer that can play a few different positions. T.J. will be. Exiting soon to join the Puerto Rican team for the World Baseball Classic. His grandfather was Puerto Rican, so he qualifies. Rene Rivera, who's on deck, will also be part of that team. The slider dribbled down to first, and Guriel makes the flip for the second out. Interesting, they had a full shift on against TJ Rivera. You don't think of him as a dead pull hitter, but the Astros had three and filled on the left side. Well, when you think of the Astros for people like us that follow teams, they are on the cutting edge as far as the sabermetrics are concerned. I, I think of them, I think of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So let me ask you this from a getting ready for the season standpoint and we're five weeks out opening days five weeks from today. If you're the Astros are you shifting in spring training based on your knowledge of the hitters or are you shifting based on what you're trying to practice shifting the shifts. I think that's what you're doing getting your infielders to be in a little different positions than they're used to during uh, the course of the season. And I think of Rivera as a guy who can hit the ball to all fields. Mm -hmm. But you want to get Altuve on that other side of the bag, you know, a little longer throw. Rene Rivera batting eighth and catching today. Travis Darno played yesterday, had another good day. It's two starts, two good games for Darno, which is something the Mets are keeping a very close eye on this spring. You and I watched him take BP today. It didn't even seem like the same player from last year. Well, there's Jay Reed's Familia getting up and getting ready to pitch in the third inning. Familia will be making his first outing of the spring. Still unknown what length his suspension will be to start the year. But what we do know is that Familia will join the Dominican team for the World Baseball Classic and probably sometime after he is done in the Classic. He and the Mets will find out his suspension. Do you think uh, Reyes's suspension will be somewhat of a precedent for Familia? Well, I think his and and uh, Aroldis Chapman. Chapman's, yeah. I think okay. somewhere will both there. be guidelines that baseball will use. Rivera out on strikes. First strikeout for Joe Musgrove. Mets are down one, two, three, and Familia is coming in.
that in spring training. This is what he's talking about. Well, what's interesting there, you see Robles with the comeback or threw the ball to third. Almost all the time after you throw a ball to the bag, you're supposed to follow your throw, but not when it, uh, when it comes to home plate. You always have to go to home plate because you want to protect the run. Run downs, bunt plays, takeoff plays. You know that last one, I remember uh, the Mets had a pitcher named Billy Taylor, right? I mm -hmm. played with him in yep. Oakland. And we spent the entire morning working on that play, and Ricky Henderson was on second base. So Billy Taylor told me, when you get to come back, you run at Ricky and you make him go somewhere. I was like, you're not going to make Ricky go anywhere, Billy. Just throw it to one of the infielders. <laughs> and this is the sad part of the story. He got the comebacker, ran at Ricky. Ricky gave him a couple of jukes. Hurt his knee. He's out for the season. Get him ready. It's not a good story. No, it's, it, it ends poorly because Billy Taylor is a good guy. Well, he is a good guy, but Met fans will give you Billy Taylor stories that oh. don't end well oh. either. Because oh, okay. remember, the Mets got Billy Taylor in the midst of a pennant race. Yes. Trading a young pitcher named Jason Isringhausen mm. to get him. Oh. And um, Billy did not perform well as a Met, let's just say. See, that was the black period for me, Gary. I was, I was not watching. <laughs> Reed Brignac leading off of the Astros. Mets have seen him around the National League East the last few years with the Phillies and then last year with the Braves. And he smacks one up the middle and Brignac's got a leadoff hit. Well, sinking fastball away, not his best one. And Brignac. And others like Brignac who are fighting for a job, each and every hit is so important. So Familia gives up a leadoff in. Now George Springer up for the second time. Springer fouled out his first time up. George Springer, who grew up in Connecticut, went to UConn. First round draft pick by the Astros. Last year played 162 games. How many guys do that anymore? Love to see it. Saws one off. Flores ranging wide had to find a grip on it to get the force play, and that's all. Mets spring training baseball is always live with the MLB.com at Bat Mobile app. Stay connected all spring with radio broadcasts, video highlights, stats, news, and more. Download MLB.com at Bat today. It's your number one app. For live baseball. Here's Alex Bregman, who had a long double to the warning track in left center his first time up. He didn't even really catch it. Shows you the kind of power that Bregman has. LSU guy, right? Number two overall pick in the draft in 2015, the first position player from that draft to make it to the big leagues. And you were saying earlier. That when you consider that Bregman got off to the world's worst start in his major league career, he actually recovered and had some pretty good numbers. This is one of those uh, young players that you ask most people around baseball, he's a can't miss guy. They had to figure out a position for him. Third base appears to be what they've decided. Well, Houston had those bad years, you remember, historical bad one loss records, but they drafted well. From 2011 to 2013, they lost 106, 107, and 111 games. That's like the early 60s Mets. <laughs> but they took advantage. They wound up with Carlos Correa and Bregman and Springer. Springer, a world of great young talent. Jay Reed's familiar working on his pick off the first. You don't see many of those from Jay Reese, who I think two or three seasons ago had a little bit of the yips throwing the bait ball around the infield. It's gotten better. Yeah, it's not like he's John Lester. No. But working on it. Well, familiar last year was all world. 51 saves led the major leagues, set a Mets club record, and uh, had nothing but. Good feelings going into the offseason, but it quickly changed course even after he gave up the home run to Connor Gillespie that ended the Mets season, the wild card game. There was every reason to think that this was going to be a very comfortable winner for Familia. 
Runner goes. The throw by Rivera skips by T.J. Rivera, and safe at second is Springer. When I was talking about before that Springer, who's a big athlete, is a great athlete, very quick, good defensive player, and here gets a bag on Rivera and Familia. Let's try by TJ to come up with that on the one hop. Tough play. So a runner in scoring position with one out. Anyway, talking about Familia, the the news of the domestic violence complaint that is going to influence the start to his season certainly uh, put a damper on whatever good feelings there were coming out of his historic season last year. Yeah, just an, uh, a, a nightmare issue for Jerry Reese and his family. to Bregman with Altuve on there. bat off the mound and Cabrera throws out Bregman for the second out as Springer takes third. Well, we mentioned the Astros 84 wins finished third last year. They're, uh, the big hurdle that they have is to try to figure out a way to beat their cross state rivals. They have just had a dreadful time of it against the Texas Rangers who won the division last year. You see that over the last Two seasons, 34 games over 500 against yeah. everybody else, and 10 and 28 against Texas. I think you can make the argument that the AL West might be the most competitive division in all of baseball with those three teams: Seattle, Texas, and Houston. Well, Seattle certainly made the most moves in the offseason. <laughs> 37 moves made by Jerry Depoto. And he has basically cleaned house from when he got there, and. You know the, the nice thing is that he's building around an incredible middle of the lineup that had uh, a spectacular season last year. Now, most people know about Cano. Almost everyone knows about Cruz. Not many know about Seager. Well because he lives in the shadow of his brother his younger brother. There's a broken bat liner and knocked down by Flores but Familia did not cover and that enables a run to score. Familia never left the mound to cover first. Had he, they might have had a play on Altuve, but because he didn't, Altuve safe. Springer scores, and the game's tied at one. Well, we've seen a few of these plays go Wilmer's way. The first beginning of spring training, and he leaps to get it, but it hits off his glove. And like you said, Familia did not cover. It just caught caught spectating. Wasn't it hard enough for Flores to catch? He he said two, caught two bullets hit in that neighborhood. That was more of a knuckleball. You know, you do all those PFP pitchers fielding practice where they tell you to get over any ball hit to the right side. You always get over, but you see this happen half dozen times in spring training. Altuve takes off first pitch, got an enormous jump against Familia, and Rivera doesn't even bother throwing it. So Familia having a rough time out there, keeping his concentration. Well, just a huge jump uh, by Altuve. Really familiar in the Mets caught sleeping there. Altuve stole 30 bases last year. So the Astros with two stolen bases in the inning. Josh Reddick at the plate. You know, not many people get on against Familia, but I'm surprised that that doesn't happen more. You know, because he's not going to be a guy that usually gives up two or three hits in a row, so you're going to have to take it upon yourself to try to push the envelope a little bit. That's lined up the middle. It hits the umpire, which is a dead ball, and it's a base hit for Marisnik. 
for uh, Reddick, excuse me. As the second base umpire, Ryan Addison couldn't get out of the way. They'll have to move Altuve back to second because it's a dead ball. Well, this is always uh, embarrassing for the umpire. And people say, how can he not get out of the way? You know, that ball sometimes just has a tracer on it. And you try as you may to get out of the way, sometimes you can't. It's actually a fortunate thing for the Mets in, in terms of the score of the game because if the umpire is not in the way, that ball's in center field and a run scores. So Reddick gets credit for a base hit. And Yulieski Goriel will step in. Year the Mets had big problems with the running game, and some of that is on the catchers, and a lot of it's on the pitchers. Well, they're going to have to get much better at that. I think when you think of the, of the pitchers that had the most problems, of course, the Syndergaard comes to mind, but uh, Travis Darnell had a tough time throwing last year, also. That's why Glenn Sherlock's here. And Sherlock, the Mets' new third base and catching coach, brought here specifically to help out the Mets catchers. One on one to Guriel. I remember early in his career, even though he was left-handed, Sid Fernandez had a hard time holding runners close, and and uh, I ended up uh, working with him a little bit because you know I was always good at that part of the game, and and uh, ended up making like a a rote thing for Sid to memorize on when to throw and when not to throw over there, depending on the on the runners, and we'd go over it in between uh, in between his starts. One two from Familia and Guriel hooks one foul. You know Gary you know a question I get all the time in spring training from fans. Are you nervous when you pitch in a spring training game. I always find that bewildering because I never went out to Mount ever without being <laughs> nervous. You know you just don't know what's going to happen. You use that nervousness as energy in fact. But, but it can't be the same it's, as going out there in front of 50,000 people it's not the same but as soon as you get runners on you start to feel the same as it does during the regular season when you're in trouble well I would think the first outing of the spring like this is for familiar has got to be the most nerve wracking Anderson got a late read on that ball but he finds it and that retires the side so the Astros cash one but strand two. We go to the bottom of the third tied one.
Fastball on when you're behind in the count, you have to make sure to get some sync to it. <laughs> First day at the ballpark. And that's a berm. You say you watch the games out there occasionally, right, Gary? That's a great place to watch. Great place for families. Lots of place for kids to run around. Veteran left-hander Tony Sipp is on for the Astros in the third. Philip Evans leads off for New York. Philip Evans, the reigning Eastern League batting champion. That's a championship that you do not want to repeat. No, that's right. He'll be playing in Las Vegas undoubtedly this year. That Las Vegas team should be stacked. Yeah, a lot of the uh, prospects that the Mets have will be in AAA this year. We're talking about Don Smith and Ahmed Rosario. Um, unless something odd happens, Brandon Nimmo will be there. Gavin yeah. Cicchini will be there. And Evans goes down on the off-speed pitch by Sip for the first out. Tony Sip had a rough year last year, but he's been a fairly reliable lefty for a half dozen years now. Well, he has. He was a, a great football player in Moss Point, Mississippi, where they take their football seriously. Was Tony Sip? He's one of those guys that's a, that was a great athlete that's kind of become a relief pitcher. Had a big problem with the home run ball last year. Gave up 12 home runs in just 43 and two thirds innings, which inflated all of his other numbers. Here's Cabrera, who led off the game with a home run. He was batting left handed and he hit one that sliced inside the left field foul pole. Now turns around about right handed. Cabrera and Sip were teammates in Cleveland a few years back. It's early, but already runners on the warning track. <laughs> Fewer and fewer players do that anymore. That's hooked to the left side. And a little collision there. Brignac, though, able to recover and make the play after Bregman almost ran him down. Well, that's the lack of experience for Bregman there at third base. I mean, you want to get everything you can as a third baseman, but you can't go laterally towards the shortstop to try to make that play. You have to be in a 45 degree angle towards first base. Nice play by Brignac. And folks will say, well, why? Well, if you go that far left, you've taken yourself out of position to make the play at first base because you can't get anything on the throw. Because all your momentum is going the wrong direction. Here's Granderson with two out. Curtis grounded out to first base his first time up and they've got the shift on against him. Still have yet to get a logical explanation from infield coaches as to why some teams overlap their third baseman to the right side and some teams just shift everybody hmm. and keep the third baseman on the left side in the shift. This is a play for Altuve and he makes the flip to Guriel in time to retire the side. Guriel is making a position shift this year, moving from third base to first base. He's still learning when to go for it and when to go back to the bag. And he almost missed. I'm not sure he touched first base at all.
In the biggest games in 2017 with the Mets ticket plan choose from a variety of 20 game 41 game and full season plans that include potential 2017 postseason access for tickets visit Mets.com slash plans or call 718-507-TIXX. Rafael Montero pitching the fourth inning throws one by Brian McCann. A real uh, tipping point kind of spring training for Rafael Montero. Three starts last year nine games for the Mets. Not very good. Well, he's gotten a chance each of the last three seasons. But he has yet at any point to establish himself. He had the one good start That's against right. Miami last year when he threw five scoreless innings. And he takes care of McCann on three pitches for the first out. Yeah, that was that was when it seemed like every day one of their young pitchers was uh, was pitching phenomenally. Right. That was right after Gazelman and Lugo started to establish themselves. It was almost as though Montero was hopping on that train, but he was not able to sustain it. Well, it's really been his lack of control. When he came up to the major leagues, that's what everyone bragged about, his, uh, his ability to control his pitches. But you saw 16 walks in 19 innings, not going to make it. But I have to imagine, as Tyler White takes a strike, that for a young pitcher like Montero, who has the ability to be as precise as he was in the minor leagues, it's got to be a mental thing that he's not able to replicate them, that in the big leagues. One and one to Tyler White. Let's go downstairs to Steve Gelb. Steve? Gary, here with uh, Dominic Smith. Not sure if anyone would recognize him, though. 24 pounds you lost this offseason. I mean, first and foremost, you look incredible. How do you feel? I feel great. I feel great. Does it feel, I mean, does it feel worlds different, though, when you're out there, especially playing? No, it definitely does. You know, I could tell the difference when I'm out there, when I'm running around or, you know, trying to just make plays on the field. I mean, I feel like it's more easy, it's more natural, and um, I just feel lighter on my feet and, and just very uh, quick. So why now? Why did you make the decision this offseason to commit yourself to fitness as much as you did? Uh, I just feel like that's a, the biggest part of your game, you know, um, besides hitting and, and the mechanics and, and fielding and stuff like that. You know, just being in good shape and, and eating healthy and just feeling good every day is definitely the most important uh, part of the game, especially if you want to stay on the field uh, every day. Was there something in particular last year that you thought to yourself, you know what? I should be better here. I, this, I'm, I'm holding myself back based on what weight I'm playing at. Oh, definitely. You know, it's a few times like you'll, you'll hit ball, smoke ball in the gap, and you know, just be a long single, or you get thrown on the second. Um, you know, trying to score from first base on a double. You know, things like that. And um, I just felt like if I if I was able to get in a better shape, those things would be much easier. Now we can all relate to the, uh, <laughs> the the trying to get in shape dilemma here. What was your weakness, though? What was the one thing that was hardest to give up food-wise? Uh, probably like burgers and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, I, I love a good burger, and you know, it was, it was a lot of weekends where I was like, man, I could just go for a nice, just juicy burger. But you know, I just had to stay strong and, and really just tell myself it's going to pay off at the end of the day. All right. Well, it looks like it's paid off to this point at least. And you know, you've had a lot of great progressing seasons here the last couple of years I know the one aspect that that you've talked about is still wanting to, to push a little more is power and we saw it 14 home runs last year but what do you need to do to reach that next plateau in terms of the power at the plate uh, I think I just got to just keep working hard every day um, I got to just keep uh, staying in tune with my mechanics and uh, you know I feel way stronger than I did last year and I was able to do that so you know this year I'm going to a more hither a friendly environment in, in Vegas so Hopefully um, when I get out there I can you know do a little bit of damage. Was there one thing that you could point to why the power was there a little bit more last year. I think uh, last year I think the power was there just because I, I, I would get better with my swing and um, I like to, to do more damage instead of get this base hit. So I'm going to try to take that approach to this season and try to just continue to just hit the ball hard hit him in the gaps and you know help my team win ball games. The one thing no one seems to question about you is the defense. I've heard gold glove multiple gold glove winner if you play in the majors regularly. What do you do behind the scenes that that we don't necessarily see that you think contributes to the type of defender you are. Uh, I think it definitely uh, I have to give the credit to like some of my teammates. I know uh, last year you know playing with a man for the last few years you know I will go over to shortstop with him and, and compete uh, and practice every day and um, 
out take our mother second base with our middle infielder, then I think just that competitiveness and uh, us just staying on each other like that has made me a good defender. And I felt like uh, I was able to, you know, help them become better defenders as well. You seem like you have incredible confidence when you're playing defense. We saw you the other day take uh, take charge of that pop up in the infield. How much of of why you're so good do you think is just based on that confidence in your own ability? Um, I think that that has to do uh, with it a lot for sure. I mean, to play this game, period, at any level, you have to have that confidence to, to feel like you belong and stuff like that. So I think uh, it, it, it's taken a few years and it's taken a lot of uh, people to help me along the way to, to kind of gain that confidence. But you definitely need it to play, uh, to play at any level. Tom Smith, awesome stuff. Congrats on the weight loss. Congrats on the progress to this point, and good luck this spring and the upcoming year. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Gary, back to you. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Dom. That was fascinating. I, I don't think I've ever heard a first baseman talk about that before, competing with his middle infielders to try and get better as a defender. Yeah, it's uh, he is a, a, a really high-caliber defensive player. And you know what's interesting? The culture here for the Mets players is to be in the best shape you possibly can be, and they're coming down here earlier and earlier. Strong inning for Rafael Montero. One, two, three with a couple of strikeouts as he takes care of Jake Marisnik. Still tied at one, going to the bottom of the fourth. Get all the latest news from Mets and Yankees spring training with insider info and exclusive interviews straight from camp on Loudmouths today at 5.30 only on SNY. Last of the fourth inning, David Paulino comes on to pitch for the Astros. He's trying to make this team out of the bullpen. This guy is 6 7 and throws hard. Uranus Cespedes leading off. Cespedes had an infield hit his first time up. Well there are spots open in that Houston bullpen. Ken Giles is their closer Will Harris their setup man but beyond that they've got spots available in the back of that bullpen. They've also got competition at the back of their rotation and a lot of questions at the front of their rotation. Dallas Keuchel who was so good two years ago had a rough year last year. And then was shut down with shoulder issues, and those issues have still been a concern coming into the spring. Lance McCullers, who looked like he was going to be the best of the bunch, had elbow problems both at the beginning and end of last year. And you see how their pitching, which was so strong for them when they made the postseason in 2015, went backwards last year. Interesting signing they had this winter, raised everyone's eyebrows. They gave a pretty good contract to Charlie Morton. Mm -hmm. Veteran sinker baller. 
If Mike fires on that staff as well. But again, it's all it's fluid. So a guy like Musgrove who started today has a shot. And this guy Polino, who started the game for the Astros late last season, is is mostly being viewed as a reliever, but he could possibly be a candidate to start as well. Colin McHugh is still with the club, right? Yep. Another guy who had a great year two years ago and then kind of came back to earth last year. Zaspidus pops one up. And Springer coming in to call. One out. Well, the Mets will play the Astros. Of course, the Mets and Astros came into the National League as expansion teams together in 1962. And it, uh, it's, it's kind of been empty the last few years after the Astros moved to the American League. But we'll pay a visit to Minute Maid Field late in the 2017 season. I just saw a schedule. I'm not going there either. I've never been to that ballpark. I mean, I've been doing games for a long time, right? Washington before here. Never been to Minute Maid Park. Well, I know that Keith always gets the trip because he's got history in Houston. Family. Well, I got history too. Maybe that's why well, I'm not maybe allowed there. They keep you out of town. <laughs> it's kind of like Keith in San Diego. That's right. <laughs> but, but I'm wondering how come during your year in Washington, how did you not go to Houston? I, I think I just had a family thing that I had to go to, and I was replaced for that series. But they've made a lot of uh, changes there. David yeah, Wright flies one out to center. Springer shading his eyes as he goes to uh Tals Hill is gone. Yeah. You but never they, liked that, did you? But they still have the pumpkins. Best catch there was maybe Beltran's. All oh, the pumpkins. That's right, because Keith thinks they're pumpkins, not oh, oranges. Minute, 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 park. Pumpkins, you know, they never, go, yeah, they never got that. To uh, now Jay Bruce. Yeah, they, they flattened the hill. Not sure how I feel about that, because yeah. it might be. For years I felt as though the hill was ridiculous and that somebody would get hurt. But you know we saw some uh, some spectacular plays there none better than the one you mentioned. But we haven't talked about Carlos going back to Houston. That's right. I mean with you not having been to Houston maybe you're not aware of just how vociferously <laughs> Carlos has been booed in that ballpark ever since he decided not to resign with the Astros after the 2004 season and sign with the Mets. Right. And every time we went back there and every time he's gone back there whether with the Mets or with the Yankees he's gotten booed. Yeah. And now 13 years later he he's an Astro again. <laughs> I would assume that the fans who booed him for the last dozen or so years will be welcoming him back with open arms. Well he, he is still a major threat when he's at the plate. Thirty nine years old. Well, mostly DH, you would have to think. It's going to be interesting, though, because, you know, they've got another DH on that bench, and Evan Gaddis, that they'd like to get some at bats for. Right. I mean, it looked as though Gaddis might be more of a primary catcher this year, but with the acquisition of Brian McCann, that, that changes that equation. So it is an interesting mix. There's ball four, and Bruce is on with a two out walk. Gaddis led the Astros in home runs last year. Yeah. Well, Beltron at this point of his career is DH because he really can't get on the field as much anymore, although he can still play the outfield. Just Well, Yankee Stadium in right field was the perfect place for him because it just isn't a lot of ground to cover. But left field in Houston That's is, true. Right? anything over your head is out of the ballpark. So we talked about, you know, maybe Marisnik platooning with Aoki in left field. Maybe when the Astros face a lefty, maybe Beltron plays left field and gets a few games out there. Here's Flores who flied out his first time up. Palmer's oh. been playing most of the first base early in these spring games with Lucas Duda still on the shelf after getting a couple of cortisone shots in his hips. Jay Bruce trying to get up to speed as a potential first base option. Started taking ground balls. Yesterday, curveball for a strike to Flores. Got to be frustrating for Lucas after the injuries the last couple of seasons. There's been some conversation that when he's ready to get on the field, and we don't know exactly when that is, maybe David Wright starts taking hmm. some ground balls at first base. 
Any way you slice it though. The guy that. Steve talked to earlier. Down the road. Yeah. Definitely next year maybe even later this year maybe Dominic Smith. Is your first base. Yeah, Not as far down the road as you think. Mm -hmm. Flores pops one up. Now Tuve tracking it. And that retires the side. So David Polino comes in and throws a hitless inning. That sends us off to the fifth in Port St. Lucie. With the beach right nearby. But it sure feels like baseball. As Drupal Cabrera providing early fireworks with a home run. Philip Evans with the defensive play of the game so far. We go to the fifth inning. Reed Brignac leads off of the Astros in a 1 1 game. Rafael Montero, who had a terrific fourth inning, stays on to pitch the fifth. Every team, the way baseball is played now, needs great rotation depth. Mm -hmm. You can't say these are our five starters and we're going to have them all year, as the Mets certainly found out last year. And the Mets didn't have a, a real solid backup plan going into last season as far as their starting pitching. They were fortunate enough to discover a couple of gems in Guzelman and Lugo. And Montero figures to be a piece of that as well. I think two things that are overlooked now by some teams rotation depth and the other thing I'll say because Keith's not here so I can allow, I'm allowed to say it is resting players is, is an overlooked kind of the better teams do it better than some others. Montero off the mound and makes the play on Brignac one away. Watch the delivery of Montero. He lands on a very stiff front leg. Everything else is very nice. See how he straightens out that leg. He doesn't keep it bent. That's unusual. But then when he lands, it's not. He's in a good position when he lands. He gets in a pretty decent position. Here's George Springer, who's 0 for 2. I want to get back to what you were talking about a moment ago about resting players yeah. because it used to be that if you were an everyday player the expectation was that you'd go out there and play 155 games a year and almost everybody's goal was to play 162 and now that's less and less common 140 is is pretty much the yeah. standard if you get to 150 that's a big deal so. I guess my question is, is it more necessary now because 
the schedule is more difficult or is it because the players are conditioned differently? I think I think it's a combination. It's a confluence of a lot of different reasons. I think the travel uh, is sometimes uh, can be very difficult. Um, I think uh, they, they train differently. And I think it's just expectations, Gary. You know, there's more and more guaranteed money uh, to players. And I think that there used to be something that you'd hear all the time. I'd rather have that everyday player at 75% than someone taking his place. You never hear that phrase anymore. Right. So I think players want to be closer to 100% every time they play. Springer wastes that one off. Well, we mentioned Springer playing 162 last year, Altuve 161. Obviously, the Astros aren't worrying about <laughs> giving right. guys rest. Well, Three he, players in the American League playing 162. That's a lot. You said 140 games or so. That's 22 games off. That's one a week, really, when you think about the schedule. Right. Springer goes down on strikes. Good looking fastball by Montero for his third strikeout. Well, I wonder also, and you know, we've talked about this a little bit over the last few years. When you guys played 30 years ago, most guys showed up at the ballpark at four o'clock for a seven so o'clock game. Now guys are in the ballpark at noon, one o'clock for a seven o'clock game. And yes, they're well taken care of in the clubhouse and they've got chefs and, and all that works positive. But do you think sometimes there's an effort to work so much that it hampers players' ability to be prepared for the long haul? Do you think the, the, the pregame work affects their fatigue later in the season. Yeah, I, I think it definitely can affect, but I think that that the player today, um, not held hostage, but I mean it, it's it, it's so important that they go through that all those ten or twelve steps every single day to get ready for a ball game. They they need that, um, but I think it does wear you out. I mean, Keith, Keith will tell you. I remember many games uh, when I was pitching on the road. And getting on the bus at four o'clock, and Keith would be on the bus. You know, that's an everyday player. Mm -hmm. He'd be showing up at four thirty, quarter to five. Right, and players, they don't really have that choice now because the peer pressure is such that if they're not there, well before with their you know mandatory report time, there's there's a lot of peer pressure that that is involved in terms of uh, you know feeling the younger players yeah. feeling as though they have to adhere to that standard. You know, I was alluding to that when Steve was talking to Dominic Smith is that. You know they have such a training regimen now that I think for a lot of players they would feel out of place if they didn't participate. They feel like they're behind the eight ball. Two and two to Bregman, and that just missed full count. I mean I played in the time where Ricky Henderson and Jose Canseco, when they were my teammates with the Oakland A's, they would battle to see who could get to spring training the latest. I mean they literally would be in town. Did Jose go today? Okay, I'll go tomorrow. Now guys are here in January. That's right. <laughs> well, there's a lot more money in the game. There's so much more at stake, and that has a lot to do with it. Three, two, and a check swing. A went around. Strike three. Two terrific innings for Rafael Montero. Six up and six down with four strikeouts. For Montero to get his spring underway with a very positive outing.
Yapes Dribble Cabrera led off the first inning with a home run. Jose Altuve drove in the Astros run. 1-1 one, one as we go to the bottom of the fifth. Alex Bregman moves from third base to shortstop for the Astros. J.D. Davis now in at third. T.J. Rivera leads off. We got J.D. at third. T.J. at the plate. That's right. We're initialed all over the place. I was just thinking that for Davis, it's got to feel like a lot of the third base ones in the past have felt behind David Wright, you know? Might not sniff a lot of playing time. Well, Bregman moving over to shortstop, that was his original position. Of course, they are fairly well set at shortstop with Carlos Correa, yeah. one of the best players in the American League. This is a... Uh, this is a Houston team that you would think if they hit on all cylinders they could score a ton of runs this year. The dribbler back to Paulino and he makes the play on Rivera one away. Every Sunday at City Field is a McDonald's family Sunday. Enjoy pregame activities including inflatables face painters and balloon artists on Mets Plaza before the game plus all kids 12 and under can run the bases after the game in the Mr. Met Dash courtesy of Northwell Health for tickets visit Mets.com slash family Sunday. I mean the Astros were 11th were um, eighth in the American League and run scored last year but you think about Beltron Goriel. You know, one of the best hitters in the world right. who is trying to make the transition to big league baseball. The development of Correa. You've got the star in um, Altuve. The possibility of McCann and Reddick adding some power. And that ballpark they play in, which is conducive to the home run. Rene Rivera flies one out to right, and Reddick almost overran it, but finds it for the second out. Yeah the ball jumps uh, at that ballpark and anything in the air down left field is a home run. Got those Crawford boxes in the left field corner as you look at Reddick battling that fly ball to a standstill. Reddick a former gold glover with the A's. He's got a fantastic arm maybe one of the best arms in all the baseball. <laughs> Welcome to Florida. That's right. I mean he's always trained in Arizona. It's a little weather conditions a little different here. So he had the sunglasses on using his hand also you usually catch most outfielders using their glove. So it's more of a, a bigger target to try to block out the sun. But he used his hand. Philip Evans struck out his first time up. And takes the curveball out of the strike zone one and one. Evans 24 years old 15th round pick by the Mets out of high school in 2011 and he had a phenomenal season at Binghamton. Well, some good scouting going on Conlon who started the games for the Mets 13th round draft pick Philip Evans 15th rounder. Evans at 335 at Binghamton in 96 games to win the Eastern League batting title. First and second round, almost anybody can pick those guys. Still can get them wrong, right? See, with Polino able to throw as many pitches as he does, wouldn't you think he would profile as a starting pitcher? Yeah. Throws a breaking ball, uh, two breaking balls. Haven't seen really a changeup yet from him, and like I said, throws 95 plus. Polino Altuve's got it side retired so two hitless innings for David Polino of the Astros sends us off to the sixth in Port St. Lucie tied at one.
there. Nice. Are you supposed to eat the snow cone with the spoon? It's not a little too, too neat. It's like eating a pizza with a, a, a fork and knife. Yeah, right? Mitt Mitt Romney Romney style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a cherry. That's a good, good one there. Also, Robles on to pitch the sixth inning for New York. Well, Robles is going to be trying to match what Montero did. Uh, outstanding effort by Rafael Montero. It really is the headline of this game so far for the Mets. We'll see Altuve up for the third time. He's already been on base twice with a walk and an infield hit, stole the base. Another snow cone being consumed with a spoon. <laughs> I mean, part of eating a snow cone is to make sure that your lips are the same color oh, yeah. as the snow cone you're eating. So, right? so are we sure this is a snow cone, or could it be Italian ices? Oh, because okay. it's a little bit different ethic involved in, in consuming the Italian ice. So there you go. That's a good Italian ice. Is there one in Corona? Is there? Oh, um, the water ice. Yeah. yeah. Fly out to right, and Bruce shading his eyes puts it away. One out. The lemon ice king. Lemon ice king. That's, that's right. The guy in uh, in Corona. Well, we don't want to overlook Consul because he's going to have a a, a bigger role uh, when the season starts if uh, what we think is going to be a suspension for Familia. Well, some combination of Robles, Salas, and Blevins, you would have to think, would move up to be the the setup guys for Addison Reed in Familia's absence. We don't talk about it too often, but uh, Addison Reed just had a tremendous season last year. Maybe his best in the major leagues, despite I know he had all those saves for Chicago early in his career. Well, Familia had a, a historic year, but he can't have that year without what Reed accomplished. Philip Evans straddling the line makes the catch in fair territory for the second out. I mean, I don't, I don't really put a lot of stock in the holds category, but boy, every time Reed was handed the lead in the, the eighth inning, it got to the ninth. And it, it was uh, not a lot of problems either. It, was, it seemed like every time he was put in that position, it was one, two, three. Well, he didn't walk anybody. Right. He had an ability to throw his fastball seemingly down the middle and nobody could hit it. <laughs> and I don't, I, I still don't know exactly what that is, whether it's that he hides the ball particularly well. But for some reason, the hitters did not see Reed well enough to be able to square him up most of the time. Yeah, the people I've talked to says that uh, the ball just jumps on you. So probably is a combination of hiding the ball, but also um, he's you know, got long arms, long legs, kind of releases that ball closer to the plate. David Wright and Kevin Long posing. Hope somebody got a nice picture. <laughs> I know we did. Yes, we did. Yulieski oh, Guriel, who in uh, in the Astros notes is now known strictly as Yuli. So mm. they've uh, they've gone to the. The shortened version. Well, you know what happens if you're if you're in the states, you're going to have a nickname at some point. Well, it's it's easier to to market yourself also if you uh, if you have the two syllable easily rememberable name. The only problem that I have, and I'm sure you probably have this as well, because we go back to the same era, is that Yuli is a little too close. To Yupi. Yeah, that's right. The Expos the mascot. Right. <laughs> yep. Slowly hit down to Evans. And another strong inning for the Mets bullpen. Hansel Robles. Nine pitches sets him down one, two, three. Hitter and hitting coach. A lot of love.
first data field. Changes for the Astros. Jonathan Singleton comes into play first base. Tony Kemp will be at second base. Ramon Laureano now in center field. And Teoscar Hernandez is in right field. And the new pitcher for the Astros, 23 year old Michael Feliz. Uh, Michael Feliz uh, made the roster last year out of spring training, but didn't stick around long. Was optioned after the second game where he appeared in relief. Wound up pitching in 47 games for the Astros last year. Low hit totals, low walk totals, but the home run ball yeah. is a big problem in that ballpark. He gave up 10 home runs in 65 innings. It's interesting. Almost every pitcher who comes in for the Astros, you have the same thing to say about mm -hmm. them. They've struggled with the home run ball last year, and that's why they finished third. But here's uh, here's the grace note on Phillies as uh, grounds maintenance continues. 65 innings, 95 strikeouts. Cabrera hits one into the shift, and Bregman throws him out, one away. Interesting, right, Gary? That uh, the Mets veterans are all getting three at bats here early in spring training, but we're talking about they go on the road the next couple of days. Right. For most of these players, this is their second outing of the spring. And uh, with the next two days on the road, most of the veterans will stay home and get a couple of days of drills before their next game action. So that means we're back here on Thursday. Right. Mets and Marlins. Is that that's Keith's game? No, I, I've, I've got that game. Yeah, I'm flying back tonight. I get I come back on Wednesday night. So wait a second. You're here and Keith's here Thursday. I think so. Oh, full house. Yes. Or Fuller House. Much better chance of getting in trouble. <laughs> one and one to Granderson. I will say this we've had two telecasts so far. The first one, it was all three of us, which is a lot of fun, but it's the worst spring training game we've seen. Yeah. Yesterday, we had a very lovely game. Crisp game. That you missed. Yes. And we're on the same pace today. So. Oh. You just shot the clown. I'm just saying that, you know, the three man booth is nice, but the, the well played game <laughs> is really what, what makes it for us. No, I was thinking of that first strike to Granderson that was called by Lance Barksdale. It was a low strike. Mm. And, you know, that's going to be a bone of contention uh, in the near future that Major League Baseball and Commissioner Rob Manfred are, are thinking of taking that low strike out of play. Well, can I tell you something? If you take the low strike out of play, how does that affect pace of game? Mm. Which is the other, you know, mantra that Commissioner Manfred is, uh, is on the warpath about. If you call fewer strikes, that does not help the pace of the game. Yeah, and if you have more offense, that doesn't help with the pace of the game either. But that it does that, help that's people a good, watch. That's it. a good trade off. Yeah. So. Nice big hop for Kemp. And Granderson retired to out. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule presented by W.B. Mason. As mentioned, the Mets are down in Jupiter the next two days against the Marlins and Cardinals. And then back here, play the Marlins on Thursday with our full house. Well, the, 1 o'clock on SNY. The Astros are the wild card, really, because they're back in West Palm Beach now. The Mets are going to be playing a lot more of the Astros. Seven times this year. Yeah. It's a good thing. They have a lot of young talented players. Well I think also you'd rather have more games against the Astros and fewer against the Braves and Marlins the teams in your own division. It's true. And the Nationals for that matter as well. There's Cespedes. I wonder tell me this the Mets Braves Nationals and Marlins all play each other a lot during spring training. The Phillies are on the other side of Florida and we never see them. Is that an advantage for those four teams or for that one team. Hmm, I think it's an advantage for the Phillies to tell you the truth. I know that when the Mets and the Cardinals were in the same division they both were located in St. Petersburg when I first started my career with the Mets and Mel Stottlemyre and David Johnson would find every reason to find a college game for you to pitch before you had to face the Cardinals too many times in spring. Well I know when we get toward the end of spring training that when the Mets 
have their big time starters scheduled to go if they're scheduled to face one of the division rivals they usually won't pitch against them pitch in a B game or some kind of a, a minor league game. Cespedes pulls one on the ground. Knocked down by Bregman. Still plenty of time. Three ground ball outs for Michael Feliz, and the Mets are down one, two, three. We head for the seventh. Into the drink. Mets and Astros tied one. Luis Guillorme will play second base. Ahmed Rosario is at shortstop. T.J. Rivera moves from second base out to left field. Brandon Nimmo is now in center field. Travis Tyrone will play right. We go to the seventh. Brian McCann leads off against Hansel Robles, who gets a second inning of work after throwing just nine pitches in a one-two-three sixth. McCann has been hit by a pitch and struck out. He takes up and away, and we check in with Steve Gelb. Steve. Lynn and PJ uh, first time ever in a big league camp for you and first time facing major league hitters two scoreless innings. What was that like out there. Uh, it was awesome. It was a great experience. You know it's something that you know I've pictured for a long time growing up playing baseball. You always you know picture yourself pitching against the uh, you know the big league hitters and to be able to do that for the first time today it was it was a really awesome experience. I mean you had such a great season last year one point six five ERA that's the lowest in the minor leagues across the board. But you only pitched in single A. I mean, the jump to, to face these hitters, could you tell a distinct difference even though it's it's very early in spring here? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can just tell the guy, these guys are up there, you know, with a, a very advanced approach. And and I just kind of trusted Renee back there. I didn't shake off one, so it's just whatever he put down, I was like, okay, that's, that's what we're going to throw. Is that what you would normally do, or are you someone that likes to take charge of your game? Um, usually I'm someone that, that likes to shake off, you know, I'll have a certain pitch in mind, and, and I'll, I'll shake till I get that. But today I was I was just going with whatever he wanted. For the Mets fans who don't know, so that's one aspect of your game they now know, what type of pitcher are you? Can you describe to the fans what type of pitcher that eventually they may see here? Uh, I would say I'm, I'm a crafty lefty, you know. I don't, I don't throw extremely hard but I, I pride myself in being able to locate pitches where I want and be able to, to change speeds and, and throw all my pitches you know for strikes and uh, different counts and stuff like that. You have a pretty funky delivery too. How did you develop that delivery and how much do you think that helps deceive the hitters. Uh, it just kind of came about you know it wasn't something that I, I set out to do to, to be funky. I think it was just you know as I got older it just kind of started to develop and it was it was comfortable for me and I was able to repeat it and. So it's just kind of gotten to that point and, and I think it, it really works my advantage because I mean it's it's hard to see the ball coming out coming out of my hand you know what I've heard from certain hitters so 
I guess that I'll just I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> You'll stick to that. It seems to be working out pretty well. Uh, the guys were talking about it. Obviously, you're a unique story, an Irish, uh, Irish native, I should say, and aren't a lot of Irish natives in the major leagues playing baseball. I know you moved to the States when you were two years old, but both parents immigrants. So how did the passion for baseball develop those? You know, both your parents were, were not baseball fans growing up. Yeah, my dad moved when he moved to California. He uh, he kind of started to take a liking to baseball and kind of taught himself the rules and stuff. But when I was a kid, you know, I was never pushed to play baseball. I kind of did on my own. I used to play uh, video games when I was a kid. You know, baseball video games and one day. Ken Griffey baseball. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then one day, I just told my parents, "Hey, I, I want to play baseball." And they're like, "Okay." I mean, I guess we'll sign you up for baseball. And then. Each year, I just kept wanting to play, and it, that's kind of how it started. And eventually, you, you landed at San Diego State. You're playing with Chris Bryant when you were there, right? You were a freshman. He was a junior. Um, as someone who is now a professional player as well, I mean, you have a lot of talent, but when you get there and you see a Chris Bryant, is it immediately clear that it's a totally different level? I mean, yeah. When I played with uh, Chris at University of San Diego, we... Um, it Sorry, was... University. Yeah, great. All right, no problem. Good job. No problem. Nice subtle correction right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was easy to see how, how uh, polished he was and how advanced of a hitter he was. And so, you know, being able to see that up close kind of gave me, you know, uh, an early look or a sneak peek into, into you know, these kind of hitters up here. And, and so it was just fun to watch, you know, being that close to him. B.J. Conlon, he was poised out there for the first two innings, poised in this interview. <laughs> Thanks so much for the time, and, and good luck here moving forward. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, Gary, back to you. And Steve will never again confuse an Aztec right. wow. and a Torero. That was dangerous. <laughs> it's all right. We've all been there. I remember the time that I um, misidentified Matt Dendecker as being from Florida State. Oh, oh did fighting the, words. Did the University of Florida Gator <laughs> people give me a hard time? <laughs> Jake Marizdik 0 for 2. Meanwhile, Robles has retired five in a row. By the way, some context on the Irish born major leaguers. The last Irish born major leaguer was a guy named Joe Cleary, who pitched for the Washington Senators in 1945. Wow. He actually um, uh, came from Ireland, lived in New York, and uh, uh, spent his retirement years in Yonkers. He lasted just a third an inning. Hopefully, P.J. Conlon will have a much longer major league career. Meanwhile, Council Robles finishing off his stint with a strikeout. Six up and six down for him. Still 1-1 one, one in the seventh. Discover the new state. Wilmer Becerra up for the first time. Becerra, the 
throw in in the deal where the Mets acquired Noah Syndergaard and Travis Darno for R.A. Dickey. There's Juan Santana, the former Met, now doing the catching for the Astros. Andrew Applin is in left field. But Becerra has really come into his own as a brighter prospect over the last couple of years. Yeah, his development has been surprising to some. He's a big kid. He's 6'3, 225, and maybe looks a little bigger than that. But he hit 312 here in St. Lucie last year. Still just 22 years old, so the Mets have uh, some hopes for Becerra and his ability to eventually get to the big league level. Got that Salvador Perez kind of body, right? Thing about the trade when the Mets made the deal with Toronto, by far the number one guy in the deal for the Mets was Travis Darno. Syndergaard was a great arm yeah. that they knew had potential, but they didn't know he was going to be nearly as good as he has become. Three and two to Becerra. It's amazing how the light bulb goes on for for certain players or pitchers, and like you said, it's been more of a struggle for Darno to get out of the blocks, and Syndergaard has been lighting it up since day one. 3 2 coming. And Becerra fouls it off. I was amazed um, two years ago when spring training, Syndergaard pitched in the game. I was like, you know, he still had a lot of work to do. And he came up later that year against the Cubs, and I was like, he doesn't have much to do now. I think it was a maturity thing, was an important thing for Noah, every pitcher. Well, you remember the year before he came up. There was a lot of anticipation that he would be brought up the second half of that season That's talking right. about 2014 and he just didn't pitch well enough in Vegas to warrant it and there was a lot of frustration I think on his part because he you know he thought much like uh, Harvey and DeGrom before him that he was going to be the next in line and it, it didn't quite go that way. Yeah that's a good call Gary that the precedent had been set with Harvey and DeGrom. And Becerra strikes out to start the inning but I, I think that also in Noah's mind enabled him to raise the bar and maybe up his game and understand what it was going to take to make it. You know the same thing happened to me and in, in the end of 82 after my first year in Triple A I thought I'd be coming to the major leagues but I wasn't called up and I was like how can I not be called up to the Mets they're horrible mm -hmm. and uh, but it, it made me get a chip on my shoulder and I was much better the next year. There's Travis Tyrone up for the first time took over in right field for Jay Bruce. Pitchers afternoon so far the Astros one run four hits the Mets one run three hits the only run for the Mets coming from their first batter of the game an opposite field home run for as dribble Cabrera. That's gotten some tremendous relief pitching in this game. Two perfect innings from Rafael Montero two perfect innings from Hansel Robles. And while the Astros bullpen's been even better, they haven't allowed a hit. An inning from Tony Sip, two from David Polino, and now Michael Feliz has gone an inning and a third without allowing a hit. And he strikes out Tyrone for the second out. So back to back strikeouts for Feliz to start the home seventh. Well, Feliz has good sink on his fastball and a pretty devastating slider so far in this game. See how where he got that 13 strikeouts per nine innings number from last year. Here's Wilmer Flores who's played the whole game at first base, flied out and popped up 0 for 2. Feliz reminds me a little bit when I watch him, same kind of body type and stuff. Reminds me a little bit of Michael Pineda for the Yankees. Pineda has the ability to be so dominant at times, but he's been a bit of a puzzlement yeah. at other times. Another guy who uh, gave up a lot of home runs last year. That's it in the air to left field. Chasing Applin back to the track at the wall. It's out of here. Lola Flores gives the Mets the lead with his first home run of the spring.
two to one New York. Well, a little hanging slider from Feliz to Flores, and he did not miss it. You know, we talk about all the time young everyday players developing in the major leagues. You know, Flores is, seems like he's getting better every year up at the plate. Well, last year he became an unstoppable force against left handed pitching. Now try to see if he can duplicate that against right handers and there's a notch in his belt against a right hander who looked awfully tough up until that point. One on one to T.J. Rivera who's been up twice grounded out both times began the game at second base playing left field and you know, much like we saw Matt Reynolds play some left field yesterday uh, Ty Kelly before he left for Team Israel being worked all around the diamond the Mets trying to find out how many places they can trust players who might be their utility guy. Well I always say that whoever won the World Series you're going to have copycats that are trying to do what the Cubs do now that being said the Cubs have outstanding young players that they can move like Chris Bryant. Well also I think there are few teams that can put a Swiss Army knife defensive player like Javier Baez on the field. So true. I mean Joe Madden said it yesterday and I'm not sure that he's wrong. He said I might have the two best defensive shortstops in Major League Baseball. And they're both on the same team. Right. Russell is not as flashy as Baez. But he covers a lot of ground. Unbelievable. Great athlete. When you see Addison Russell in the clubhouse, he looks like a NFL defensive back. Yeah, TJ with a defensive cut able to fight that off. TJ was talking yesterday about how he got to go back to his old high school in the Bronx, Lehman High, and talk to kids during the offseason. What a thrill yeah. that had to be for him and them to know that a kid from Lehman High could make it to the big leagues. Centeno makes the throw to first to complete the putout, but Wilmer Flores puts the Mets in front with his first home run of the spring. Mets second home run of the day. And we head to the eighth. Mets two, Astros one. It's a day for the preschoolers, right? Oh, right. The school kids are all in school, but the little kids, well, they're out in force today. And I mean, there are a lot of them. Right. All enjoying a day in the sun with mom and dad and watching their big league heroes, many for the first time. 
T.J. Rivera will try another position. He's at first base now. Brandon Nimmo moves from center to left, and Champ Stewart is now in center. Josh Edgen will pitch the eighth inning, and his first pitch is outside to J.D. Davis. Well, Edgen, you see, last year, not a lot of work in those 16 games. He's already pitched uh, once in spring training so far. I think he pitched over in Fort Myers. Yeah, that was the game where the Mets had a no-hitter going through six innings, and Edgen gave up a couple of hits and a couple of runs in the seventh. Davis, his first at bat of the game, had a good year playing in double A last year, 23 home runs. It's a big camp for Edgen. Well, you know, a, a month ago, you would have said he was a pretty fair bet to make this team, but with the re signing of Jerry Blevins, that changes the equation for the left handers competing for a spot. Of course, the Mets have Josh Smoker, who came up and made an impression last year. Now, Edgen promptly walks the leadoff hitter on four pitches. So the Astros have the tying run aboard. Tonight at 6 join the discussion as a panel of team insiders connect with fans via social media to tackle all your questions about the latest Mets news plus game highlights and up to the minute reports from camp on Mets talk live tonight at 6 only on SNY. Get a pinch runner for the Astros. Derek Fisher is the pinch runner. Hmm. So Edgen having trouble throwing the ball over the plate, and Jorge Carrillo brings the ball back out to him. It's one of those mounds vi mound visits you shouldn't have any problem with. <laughs> Is there anything more complicated than throw strikes, or is there some? Greater message that a catcher can bring at that point. Well, it depends on the pitcher. Um, some catchers will come out there and be, you're, you know, they'll really chide you for not throwing the ball to the play. Stuff like, you know, your stuff's too good not to stro throw strikes. Come on, let's go. But it's never a, a mechanical message, is it? No, not usually. Now, you might have that during the regular season. A catcher who catches you a lot might be able to. Uh, say something about your mechanics that you're not doing, but not, not in spring training. You're dropping your arm or yeah. something like that. Not keeping your front shoulder closed. Mm -hmm. Ramon Laureano batting for the first time. The runner goes, a bouncer to third, and Evans will have to go to first with it. So the Astros find a work in the run. Mm -hmm. And that gets the pitch runner Fisher over to second. Well, the Mets have 11 players going to the World Baseball Classic. First to leave was Ty Kelly. He's on his way to South Korea to play for Team Israel. The others will be heading out over the next few days. It's quite a flight. What, 17, 18 hours to South Korea? It's a long way to go to play a few baseball games. But it's a great opportunity for yeah. a guy like Ty to be a, a, a part of that on the world stage. Here's Alec Bregman up for the fourth time. They've already talked about maybe not next year, but the year after, maybe having some baseball games in London or Paris. Regular season games. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, the NFL has done it successfully. Pulled down to third. Evans with another diving stop and makes the throw on target. What a defensive game Philip Evans has had at third base. My new favorite player, Philip Evans. Amazing how much room that he's able to cover, how much ground he's able to cover. He was well off the line, but still got to that baseball. Well, Evans came with the reputation as quite a hitter after winning a batting title last year in double A, but showing off the glove today. Second time he's saved a double, making a terrific diving stop to the line. Now Tony Kemp up for the first time. And picked out of the dirt by Carrillo, ball one. 
Kemp took over for Jose Altuve at second base. We mentioned Kemp earlier because he is a Jose Altuve size alike at five foot six. He had been an outfielder in the Astros organization, but they're working him in the infield this year, particularly at second base. Which sounds like a, a dead end if you're yeah. Tony Kemp. <laughs> Two and oh. Not too many changes for Houston uh, other than Beltron Bregman playing all year. Texas hasn't made a lot of changes. Napoli addition. Redick will be oh, right, addition for Houston. But Seattle is is changing a little bit. We talked about the middle of their lineup, but you know they have they've had Leonis Martin. Leonis Martin over there, but they've added Gerard Dyson, who gives them a lot of speed, mm -hmm. and Gene Segura, who's going to play shortstop for them. Well, Segura was revelation last year. There's ball four, second walk of the inning for Edgen, and this time walking the left hand hitter. Our next broadcast here on SNY will be Thursday afternoon when the Mets host the Marlins. City spring training baseball. One o'clock Thursday afternoon here on SNY. Now Teoscar Hernandez, who is another competitor for the uh, the right-handed outfield job for the Astros. He and Marisnik really battling for that spot. He was in 41 games with Houston last year. Have gotten some fine pitching today. Two innings by PJ Conlon to start. J. Reese Familia gave up a run in the third. That's driven out to left center. Over goes Stewart to run it down. And that retires the side. Hernandez hit it hard. Champ Stewart makes the play and saves Edge in some heartache. He walks two, but still two to one New York. Monday, April 3rd is. The latest scoops and developments from spring training featuring behind the scenes video and live updates straight from Port St. Lucie on Mets blog presented by City featured on SNY.TV. Where a Carrillo leads off in the bottom of the eighth. Colin Moran in to play third base for the Astros. Keegan Yule will pitch the bottom of the eighth. Well, he had a nice year in double A Corpus Christi where he won eight games, went 0 3 when they moved him up to triple A.
Here's Anibal Sierra, who's now in its shortstop for the Astros. A lot of pitches up and into the Mets in this game. I wonder if it's a, a decision by the Astros to pitch more inside. Mm. That'll stop them from giving up as many home runs. Seems counterintuitive, but it's not. Rio flies one out to center, and Loriano is there. Well, other than Lance McCullers, they, they're really not a hard throwing staff. Guys like Dallas Keuchel, Colin McHugh, they're more finesse pitchers. Finesse pitchers, but the more you are a finesse pitcher, the more you have to pitch inside. Well, here's Philip Evans who gets a nice hand from the crowd, recognizing his work in the field today. He's gone 0 for 2 at the plate. Well it looks like the Mets are going to use Tom Gorzolani in the ninth inning today and this is going to be interesting to watch because Gorzolani to me has the potential to be a, a really interesting piece for the Mets. Another left hander a veteran who didn't have a good year last year but has a pretty good track record. Here's Tom. I remember a couple few years ago now but he and Sean Burnett were a big part of that Nationals bullpen. I believe in 13. I right, going back a little further. He was a starting pitcher in Pittsburgh right. to start his career. He and um, so he and Zach Duke came up about the same Zach time. Zach Duke, Paul Mahalam, right? Ian Snell. And it's interesting that that Gorzolani and Duke now have both found work as relief pitchers. Evans flies one out to center. Another chance for Loriano, and there are two out. Yeah, Duke has, uh, has really revitalized his career. Dropped his arm angle a little bit. Now Ahmed Rosario will bat for the first time today. Rosario had an infield hit and drove in a run in yesterday's game. And that's number one prospect. Has been getting a lot of playing time early in the spring. The guy like Rosario, who you know is going to be playing in AAA this year, what's the ideal amount of time to keep him in big league camp, mm. do you think? It's a really good question. Um, I think that for a player like Rosario, who is one of your uh, one of the best prospects in all of baseball, is that you don't want him. We call it caddying, picking up a guy in the sixth, seventh inning and getting one at bat per game. You want him down in Triple A, where he's going to get his four at bats per game, helping with that development. So you figure you give him at least two or three weeks over in the minor league camp bef before the season yeah. starts. You know, there, there's there's a date um, where teams start to unload some of their guys down to minor leagues. One, because they want them to get work, and two, I think it's a financial decision also. Big league camp guys make a little more than, a lot more than once you go down to the minor league camp. Well, I know that every time Ahmed has been in a game since the uh, games began a few days ago, on the ground is short in a backhand play. And that Sierra gets him to retire the side. There's been a palpable buzz in the stands. The fans very much want to see this kid as much as possible, at least for this early part of spring training. We're heading to the ninth. Mets lead the Astros two to one.
New York Mets to help local baseball and softball leagues with grants, clinics, and Mets game experiences. Right now, we're accepting applications for local youth baseball and softball leagues to nominate a league in need. Apply today at sny.tv slash playball. We go to the ninth inning in Port St. Lucie. Mets lead the Astros 2-1, and the veteran Tom Gorzolani will take over. I saw his uh, season with the Indians, only seven games for Gorzolani. I was uh, mentioning before that Zach Duke dropped his arm angle a little bit. Well, Gorzolani's doing that also. Started that a couple of years ago in mid-season when he was with the Tigers. Jeff Jones, the Tigers pitching coach, had him drop his arm. And um, even though he didn't spend much time in the majors last year, between the majors and minors last season, lefties hit just 163 mm -hmm. against him. So clearly, he's found a little bit of a niche with that lower arm angle to get left hand hitters out and why you drop it as a, a left handed specialist like Gorzolani is is that it makes it really tough for the left handed hitter it's almost like you're throwing the ball from first base Jonathan Singleton up for the first time and takes the breaking ball inside two and one. Coming up tonight on Geico Sports Night, all the spring training news. College hoops getting toward its uh, nut cracking time. And the NHL and NBA highlights as well. Did I mention there's a big game tomorrow night in Newark? Yes, you did. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I was, I was just thinking about Jonathan Singleton. There was a time in the Houston organization that he was looked upon like we are looking at Dominic Smith here in spring training, right? Well, he and Springer were really in the same category, but Singleton's had some uh, some off the field issues that have set him back. Two-two from Gorzolani, and he just missed with the fastball. Three and two. Each team with only four hits today. Mets have gotten solo home runs from as Dribble Cabrera and Wilmer Flores. The Astros have not had a hit since the third inning. And it's inside ball four and Singleton is on with the leadoff walk. So the Astros get the tying run aboard at the top of the ninth. Good at bat there by Singleton. And now the former Met Juan Santano will bat for the first time. Another left hand hitter. We'll get a pinch runner for Singleton. Jack Mayfield will run at first base. Here's Mayfield. Juan Santana, who will always have the claim to fame, he was the first big league catcher to throw out Billy Hamilton oh, trying right. to steal a base. He did that as a Met. He was he was in Milwaukee last year, right? We saw Juan. Yes. And we saw the Astros play hit and run last inning where they got a man on base in a one run game. We've also st stolen a couple of bases in this game. Mm -hmm. How would you rate Gorzolani's move? Um, he, he doesn't have an, a, a great move. That's ripped into right field. A base hit for Centeno. Boxed around by Tyrone, but Mayfield will stay at second. So the Astros have the tying and go-ahead runs on base with nobody out. Good swing there by Centeno. Just a fastball right down the middle. And that ball didn't catch a lot of leather there as it bounces off the body of Tyrone. So the first two get aboard against Gorzolani. He'll get another left hand hitter now, and A.J. Reed up for the second time. Reed took a call third strike against Hansel Robles his first time up. And he takes a breaking ball for a strike. Reed, uh, a huge kid who's got tremendous power, really struggled in his first big league stint last year. Played in 45 games for the Astros, hit just 164 with three home runs. Good job, good boy. 
but at 6'4", 275. Ooh. We've seen a pitcher at 268, a player at 275. It's like we're at the, uh, the combine. <laughs> I think that starts this weekend. How many times can they bench press 225? That's a good breaking ball by Gorzolani to get that one too. Mayfield at second, Santana at first with nobody out. O2 to Reed. Pulled on the ground. That'll find the hole. Mayfield being waved around third. Tyrone comes up and throws to the plate. It's cut off. The throw goes to third. And out of third base is Santano for the first down of the inning. But the Astros tie the game on a run scoring hit by A.J. Reed. And it's now two to two. Well, nice hitting by Reed. A breaking ball that he's able to place in the hole. Good job by Gary Pettis, the third base coach, to wave the runner home. And Tyrone hit the cutoff man. Good things can happen. Although I thought he was safe at third base. No replay in spring training, but I agree with you. Although he might oh, have blocked it he, with his leg. He blocked him with his leg. Nice job by Evans, who's done uh, a lot of good work at third base today. So that play goes 9 3 5. Good cutoff by TJ Rivera, who doesn't have a lot of experience playing first base, but did his job there. Now Alejandro Garcia bats for the first time. TJ has played second base, left field, and first base in this game. So Gorzolani's faced three left hand hitters, hasn't gotten any of them out, and now the right hand hitter Garcia adds a base hit. So three straight hits after a leadoff walk, and now the Astros have two on with one out. Let's look at third base. I, I think just um, Evans' leg. Uh, had the umpire calling that ball out. But let's see if he gets his foot in at all. Well, it's the toe. base move, yeah. but could that have been the foot hitting the bag or the foot hitting the leg which hits the bag? Yeah, or Evan's leg. Yeah, exactly. In any event, the third base umpire, Nick Marley, called him out. And with no replay in spring training, we just continue playing the game. How refreshing. Can you imagine? <laughs> Here's Colin Moran up for the first time in the game. And he takes a breaking ball low and away for ball one. Well there's nobody throwing in the Astros bullpen but the pitcher who pitched the eighth Keegan Yule is down there and looks like he's about to start doing some throwing to stay loose for the bottom of the ninth. Mm. I mean, often they'll shut off these games after nine, but not after eight and a half. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and there's a strike to Moran, one on one. I hear you say the other day that you're not totally against the pitch clock at some point. Well, I, part of the game. I think I've changed my feelings about it mm. just because of the circumstances that have enveloped this game over the last few years getting slower and slower. I think it might be necessary yeah. and I know that folks who have watched minor league games with the pitch clock say that it's worked wonders. Yeah they rave about it that it's not intrusive that because the pitchers understand they have to pitch within the allotted time limit 20 seconds they just do. And it's it's really not an issue but the game moves at a better speed. But that would be a it would be a big step for Major League Baseball to take. No swing and it's three and one. Well it's spring training would be a nice time to start it wouldn't it. I guess. Well they're going to experiment with that extra inning rule in the World Baseball Classic where by the way it makes sense. Yeah. Because you, you've got you know everybody's on pitch counts and you don't want to wear people out in March. I don't think that will ever get to the major leagues. Starting runner at second base and extra innings. There's ball four. Hmm. So Guerzolani really struggling. Five batters face. They've all reached. 
two walks three singles and Dan Worth is going to go out for a conversation. The Astros with a run in here in the ninth to tie it now with the base is loaded and one out. Well I think one of the hardest things to do as a pitching coach or a manager as you're looking at older players in spring training is is you know how do you judge this outing by Gorzolani if it was one of your younger players you'd probably be shipped off to minor league camp in a couple of days but you know the track record of Gorzolani is good so you might get many more times to show his stuff. Well, there's nobody throwing behind Gorzolani who's thrown 18 pitches to this point. Ramon Laureano will come to bat with the bases loaded and one out. His second at bat, he grounded out his first. Danny Worthen just motioned to the bullpen, get up the right hander. And I think Ricky Bonus is trying to figure out which right hander that is. <laughs> and it's going to be Kevin McGowan, who looked awfully good the other day in his uh, first stint of the spring. He'll start to loosen up. And Laureano takes a strike. A little more zip on that fastball from Gorzolani. Tom Gorzolani now 34 years old. And Laureano reaches for it and fouls it back, and it's 0 2. Change up one and two. The go ahead run, A.J. Reed is at third, Garcia at second, Moran at first with one out. Rosalani trying to pitch himself out of a big time mess. And Loriano takes strike three call. Not sure what he was looking for, but. Takes a fastball, and that's the second out. You know, when you're facing a left hander, if you're a right handed hitter, you expect everything to be middle of the plate away. Well, Gorzolani executed that fastball on the inside corner and dotted him. So now a chance for Tom to get through it with the game still tied. Anibal Sierra comes up for the first time. So he played in the Dominican Summer League last year, which is like below rookie ball. <laughs> so this is a big moment for this kid. And it goes to the backstop. It comes right back to Carrillo, and the runners can't advance. That was a wild enough pitch by Gorzolani that it didn't cost him a run. Hmm. Well, good job by A.J. Reed at third base. He wanted to come, but the ball hit right off that padding and came right back to Carrillo. You know, you see this more and more in the game today. Less so here because there is a lot of room behind home plate, but in some of the the newer major league ballparks home plate is so close to the backstop that's not an unforeseen circumstance. Now it's two and zero oh with the bases full. Nothing coming easily for Gorzolani. About to throw his 25th pitch of the inning. And it's 3 and 0. Well, you know Sierra's going to be taking a pitch. Strike three and one. Now this is where it's a pitcher. You just got to challenge this young hitter. Hope he gets himself out. Base is loaded, two down. Three one to Sierra. And he chased one, three and two. Fastball up and just away enough. Yeah. 
Reed at third, Garcia at second, Moran at first. The merry-go-round will be in motion with three and two and two out. And ball four forces in the go-ahead run. What a nightmarish inning for Tom Gorzolani. His third walk of the inning. Reed comes in to score, and the Astros lead three to two. And it couldn't go any worse for the veteran out here. Control issues, giving up hits. Breaking ball has been pretty flat. And, you know, it doesn't matter how veteran a player you are. You come to a new organization, your first outing yeah. for your new team, the last thing in the world you want to do is have something like this melt down on you. Yeah. Three hits and three walks in the inning have produced two runs. Tony Kemp up for the second time. He walked his first time up against Josh Edgen in the eighth. And the slider stays inside, ball and a strike. And the one thing I've noticed in this inning is he's faced a lot of left handers. They have not been bailing against uh, that dropped down arm angle. Staying right in there. Well, his, uh, his breaking ball has not been crisp yeah. for the most part. A fastball rides inside. It's two and one. Get to a certain age where when you have these outings in spring training, you're really fighting for your baseball life. Well, that's where there's an advantage to it being February 27th. Yeah. Because you're likely to get a couple more cracks at it even after your worst day. That's lined into right center field and a base hit that'll bring in at least two. Garcia is in, so is Moran. Now they've got uh, the hitter, Kemp trapped between first and second. Break for the plate. Rivera makes the throw home. And Moran and uh, Sierra is out at the plate to end the inning. But two runs score on the base hit by Tony Kemp. And the Astros score four in the ninth against Tom Gorzolani and lead it five to two going to the bottom of the ninth. Astros scored four runs in the top of the ninth inning. Mets will try and respond against lefty Frombert Valdez. Great name. That's a new name for us, I think. That's I don't right. think I've we've run into a before. Fronder before. Frombert. Brandon Nimmo leads off in the last of the ninth. 
Nemo's first at bat of the afternoon. And he chops one to the right side, hustling in his Kemp to make the play, one out. Twenty-three-year-old Fromber Valdez, who pitched in the Appalachian League last year. That's rookie ball. So some uh, very young players for Houston late in this game. Well, those are the guys that make the trips. You know, probably didn't even expect to get in the game. But Luis Guillorme will bat for the first time. Yorme had a triple in yesterday's game, hit it down the left field line. Yorme is uh, supposed to be a great clubsman, right? Mm -hmm. He's considered an even better defensive player than Ahmed Rosario. Hmm. Best defensive player among the infielders in the organization. And then we're back to where defense matters again, or is at least important. To an Oda Guillerme. Well, the Mets took the lead in this game in the bottom of the seventh on a Wilmer Flores home run. The Mets' second home run of the day, but they've had only two other hits. And Guillerme chops one toward third. Moran plays the hop, and the quick throw gets him two out. Two swing of the bat, really. That's all the Mets' offense today. So Framber Valdez has retired his first two on ground balls and the Mets are down to their final out with Wilmer Becerra coming up for the second time. Becerra struck out his first time up. We'll be back with you on Thursday afternoon here in Port St. Lucie Mets and Marlins at one o'clock on SNY. There'll be a full boat. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Marlins with a possible sale or not. Well, there is so much for them to deal with yep. this season. The sale, I think, comes far behind yeah. trying to rebound emotionally from the devastation that they suffered last September. Also, I mean, from an emotional standpoint first, but also from pitching standpoint yeah. how do you possibly replace that one of the best pitchers in the game one and two now to Becerra I'll never forget that broadcast I'm sure you won't either no. well I give so much credit to the, the Marlins and the way they handled that entire situation from John Carlos Stanton and D Gordon all the way down yeah. And the news that Jose Fernandez's daughter was born on Friday, adding to the emotional toll. Becerra takes a call, third strike, and that'll do it for this one. A one-two-three inning for Fromber Valdez. The Astros score four in the ninth to overcome the Mets this afternoon. Final score: Houston five, and the Mets two. Well, it's a shame for the Mets because their bullpen was so outstanding until they got to Tom Gorzolani, who gave up those four runs in the ninth. And just the two swings, really, the offense for the Mets with Cabrera and Wilmer Flores with the solo home runs. Maybe the most encouraging thing we saw all day, the two scoreless innings thrown by Rafael Montero, who was spectacular. Four punch outs. There's your game summary. Let's get home runs from Cabrera and Flores, but the Astros get four in the ninth to win it five to two. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by City, proud partner of the New York Mets. By Audi, visit a tri-state Audi dealer today and get behind the wheel of the Audi model you've always wanted. By the Better Network, Verizon, better matters. And by Ram Trucks, guts, glory, Ram. Final score this afternoon, the Astros five and the Mets two. We're back with you on Thursday afternoon when the Mets host the Marlins at 1 o'clock right here on SNY. Now for Ron Darling, Steve Gelbs, and our entire SNY crew, I'm Gary Cohen in Port St. Lucie. We'll see you again on Thursday afternoon right here at First Data Field.